Good afternoon once again, and welcome to the last in our series of Trade Ahead Talks, a series of informal conversations uh, with trade agencies across, provincial trade agencies across the prairies and a uh, guest from one of our key markets. Again, my name is Carlo Dave. I'm the director of the Trade and Investment Center at the Canada West Foundation. And on behalf of CWF, and our partners, Saskatchewan Trade Export Partnership, World Trade Center Winnipeg, Edmonton Global, and good old Calgary Economic Development here in YYC, like to welcome you to the last of our trade talk series. I also like to start out by thanking our partner EDC, uh, Export Development Canada. Along with the trade agencies I mentioned, EDC is a great partner for Western Canadian prairie businesses looking to go abroad. We've got a real good strong toolbox for small companies here in Western Canada and EDC is a great part of that as well. As I noted, this is the last of the series. If you've enjoyed this series, please do let us know. Uh, we're discussing amongst ourselves whether or not to continue. So if you've enjoyed the series, write to me here at Canada West. If you have complaints, criticisms or suggestions, you can find uh, Marriott Muller at World Trade Center, Chris Decker at Step, Mustafa at Edmonton Global and the others very, very, very easily for complaints. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have with us a good friend, uh, Canada's ambassador to Mexico, Graham Clark. Uh, Mexico is you know, Canada's, one of Canada's top five trade partners and the top five trade partner for each of the Western provinces. You know, we tend to look further abroad for, for trade opportunities, but a market of over 130 million people to whom we're connected by class one rail with a population with a per capita GDP that's higher than China is something we really need to, to take a, a longer look at. So while everyone in their pet dog Fido has put on an event about the United States and the new NAFTA, at Canada West and with our partners, we thought we'd take a look at the other NAFTA trade partner. Uh, where are the opportunities? What are the risks further south? And to do that, we're delighted, honored to have with us distinguished, esteemed, distinguido, estimado. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Western Canada, Graham Clark. Graham, take it away. Carlo, I'm, and uh, thank you for that very warm and friendly uh, introduction. And I'm really, I'm delighted uh, to be here. And I'm delighted to have accepted this, um, this event because I don't accept everything that uh, is uh, thrown my, uh, my way. And uh, the timing of this is particularly uh, interesting given developments on the ground in Mexico. And we'll get to that a little later in the 10 minutes that I have been allocated by, uh, by Carlo. You know, the most interesting word in the presentation or the title of the presentation is the word other. As you've just said, Carlo, you know, we spend a lot of time as Canadians thinking uh, about uh, the US market and opportunities there and the impact of decisions taken in Washington. And Mexico is a bit of an afterthought uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that reflection. And in the same way, Mexicans, uh, when they look north, uh, they don't often look beyond uh, what's happening in Washington, although to their credit, they do take the relationship with Canada uh, uh, seriously and, and uh, we have at the officials level wonderful sustained uh, contacts and we have the sort of political attention that we need when we get uh, into uh, trouble on such and such a file. Before touching on, you know, the commercial aspects of the relationship, it's it's really interesting to look at the sort of the people to people, the sort of softer elements, right, of the relationship, and uh, those elements are educational. Uh, Mexico is a very important educational market uh, for us. And before the pandemic, we had twenty seven thousand students, I think, coming to study in Canada uh, every year. Those are those are significant uh, numbers. We have half a million Mexican tourists. Again, this, these are pre-pandemic uh, numbers who, who, who visit uh, 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 Canada. We have seasonal agricultural workers who come and work on our farms and are critical elements in our, um, in our food chain. Um, and of course, things go in the other direction. Two and a half million Canadians, more or less, 
travel to uh, travel to uh, uh, to Mexico uh, every year, not just not just to go to the beach, uh, because this is such an interesting and rich country from a cultural perspective. Uh, they travel increasingly to uh, to other parts of Mexico. So, you know, that people to people side, I know it's soft, but it's very important. Um, and it really colors uh, the, uh, the greater uh, relationship. Uh, Carlo, you put some numbers on the table. I'm not going to disagree with you. The, 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 the trade relationship is a, is a, uh, is a very important uh, relationship. And that's due, of course, to the signing uh, of NAFTA. Uh, and uh, um, despite the pandemic, we've been able to sustain uh, Mexico as Canada's third uh, most important trading partner, which is really, really interesting. Um, and, uh, and Canada, the seventh most important partner for, for Mexico. In terms of investment, and we'll get a little more into the nitty gritty of that, but we're the third most important foreign investor in Mexico after the U.S., uh, and Spain with a portfolio of around $40 billion in terms of investments in the energy sector in mining um, and uh, uh, automotive and so on and so forth. <clears throat> if you look specifically at things from a Western Canada uh, lens for Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta, Mexico is within the top 10 as an export destination. Uh, and in all three provinces, the third source uh, of imports. And naturally, uh, Western Canada's agricultural advantage is evident when we are looking at bilateral trade, cereals, meat products have found significant markets in Mexico. And this is a really interesting fact. Agricultural products were the only sector where trade grew in 2020. So Canadian exports of canola and similar products grew 25% and exports of cereals such as wheat were up almost 15%. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, I've got detailed notes here about the Cosma, but you all know about the Cosma. Uh, I think the point to make is, yes, it modernizes and it simplifies, uh, but we're really still in the implementation uh, phase. And I'll give you one very sort of concrete example of that. There's, a, there's obviously uh, a, a, an important labor uh, component to the, to the Cosma. We have a new government in a uh, new administration in Washington. Uh, and they, along with Canada, will be spending uh, some time, some effort, and some capital uh, on scrutinizing uh, labor practices uh, in, in, uh, in Mexico. And in fact, Canada is uh, contributing to a significant extent to the modernization of labor practices here. And that's, uh, that's important because uh, it's important for to ensure as level a playing field as we can among the three uh, the three countries. I'm told that I have to mention the CT CPTPP, which I always have difficulty uh, uh, spitting out. And the Canada West uh, Foundation has a fantastic example from your just in time document of a water turbine manufacturer and how Western Canadian companies can benefit from the CPTPP. So a few words about challenges, and we can get into challenges on uh, uh, in our in our Q and A because that's very much top of mind, I'm sure, for many of the people who are listening to this uh, to this event, and it's certainly certainly top of mind for me as your ambassador in uh, in Mexico. So we have issues, and we face challenges in two sectors essentially: in mining and in energy. On the mining front, and I say this because uh, I've been ambassador elsewhere in Latin America, in Peru, in Bolivia, uh, I've been ambassador to the OAS. Um, mining is a complex uh, uh, activity. And uh, uh, because we are uh, a top mining country and one of the principal investors in a number of Latin American and African uh, and uh, economies and elsewhere, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about issues such as uncertainty in terms of land access, unclear uh, requirements for community engagement and consultation with Indigenous peoples, weak rule of law to protect company operations and personnel, difficult security environments, taxation issues. Those are all the issues that Canadian companies uh, face, but they face them uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Mexico. 
And as I was saying a little bit uh, earlier, uh, these are issues that the president is aware of and he has publicly asked me to get involved to help resolve those issues. And uh, I'm gonna take him, I have, we have taken him at his word and we are looking for a meeting with him so that we can discuss a way forward on some of those uh, uh, mining uh, irritants. I'd say as well that, you know, we have, we have really very good relationships with uh, uh, Mexican officials, with the Mexican government. They're, they're aware of our concerns and uh, there's a genuine attempt to, uh, to want to be helpful on the resolution of those, uh, of those files. And of course we have energy. Uh, and energy in some ways is, is, is the more complex uh, of the uh, context that we're uh, facing. Um, I won't go into a great deal to detail of what our, our presence is, but it's, uh, it's, it's significant, more than $10 billion in investments in uh, the energy sector in Mexico, both in oil and gas and uh, in the renewables uh, sector. And I'm sure you've heard that there's much uncertainty in the electricity sector in particular, and that it's affecting our investors. Fortunately, fortunately, we have uh, rules of the game, right? We have, uh, we have agreements and dis that provide disciplines, that provide recourse mechanisms, um, and uh, Canadian companies, I think, are ready to uh, explore what those provisions are to defend, uh, to defend uh, uh, their interests. Um, the history of this is a, is a long history. I mean, in terms of uh, the Mexican stance on energy issues, I guess the most recent chapter began in April of, uh, of last year when the Mexican government began introducing regulation and policy changes to favor state-owned generation, largely from fuel oil, over electricity produced by private companies, notable, notably renewable um, energy. And these have culminated in the, the recent electricity industry law, which uh, will impact adversely approximately $4.17 billion in Canadian investment in the renewables uh, sector. And of particular concern are the changes to the order of dispatch on the on the grid, which favors the CFE, the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, which is the main uh, electricity, uh, the only electricity uh, supplier and distributor uh, distributor in uh, Mexico. So the most recent developments on this file is that uh, there have been a number of uh, decisions from lower uh, courts striking down various uh, provisions in this uh, in this law. In this um, and we'll see, it will almost certainly go to the Supreme Court, the, Su the Suprema Corte, and, uh, and we'll see what, uh, what comes out of that. That's a, that's a domestic uh, issue for Mexicans to decide in their absolute discretion, of course. Uh, but I can certainly say that it's clear as, it's very clear that Canada and Mexico are embarking on different uh, divergent paths uh, on, um, on energy. Um, now, this provides us with challenges, obviously, and I've set those up, but also perhaps some opportunities, which I think is what Carlo is particularly interested in hearing about. Um, you know, Western Canadian companies have significant expertise in helping the oil and gas industry reduce its carbon footprint, and that expertise is desperately needed in, uh, in Mexico. Um, I'd also add that, that with efforts to strengthen Pemex, which is the national uh, oil uh, company, Canadian companies may see increased opportunities for contracts with the state oil company. But a word of caution, we always recommend that companies work through a local partner. And this is particularly important as Pemex has had significant payment delays uh, this year. Um, I think I'll sort of stop there because I'm, I'm sure there are all sorts of questions. Um, I wanna say from a Western Canadian perspective, of course, uh, we have um, we have uh, EDC, we have the Canadian, we have the Trade Commissioner Service present in, uh, in our embassy, as well as in Guadalajara and Monterrey. Uh, we have Alberta, an Alberta representative, uh, part of our uh, trade team. And I'm very pleased to announce, and I hope I'm not stealing somebody's thunder, that Saskatchewan is thinking of doing uh, the same thing. And they, those inputs that, that 
provincial presence, that Western sensibility, uh, those, are, um, those are very important elements and they make us stronger uh, as a Team Canada as we uh, approach uh, the challenges that we face in the Mexican market. You know, I'll end on this. I met recently with the president of the speaker, I should say, of the, uh, of the Senate, and he said, Canada and Mexico were socios inevitables, we're inevitable partners, and that's true. We are inevitably tied together in the North American uh, space. And uh, even if we're going through a bit of turbulence uh, at the moment on some of our investment files, there is the longer term reality of the shared neighborhood, um, uh, the shared disciplines that we have under uh, uh, the new NAFTA and the CTPPP, the fact that we share the neighborhood but share the neighbor as well, uh, which is a which is a slightly different, uh, a slightly different comment, uh, and uh, we have no, we really have no choice but to work uh, together. So let's make that relationship uh, as smooth, uh, as workable uh, as possible, um, and um, I really look forward to the dialogue that we'll have uh, following my uh, my remarks. Thank you very much. But thanks a lot, Graham. You know, we've always we've had the, the I'm not just uh, saying this, we've had a series of really good ambassadors down there in Mexico, going back to Gil, um, you know, Pierre and, and yourself. So we've always done well um, on the Mexican front. Thanks for those remarks. I'm sure we'll get some other questions about the new NAFTA. Um, as we like. Well, you know, is that what you'd like to call it, Carla? You know, yes. right, I'm not, a, I'm not a great, you know, my expertise is Mexico. My expertise is Latin America. My expertise is this unique cultural and linguistic concept, uh, context. Um, I'm, I'm not a trade policy uh, expert by any means, um, but I do understand Mexico. So that's my value added, I think, in this discussion. So don't ask me about chapter 11 or something like that, because I won't know. You probably know more about it than I do, Carlo. So nice, nice way to pass the buck. And <laughs> the buck. I am a diplomat after all. So <laughs> yes, we can tell. So speaking of passing the buck, let's bring yeah. in our um, provincial, provincial trade reps. Uh, we do have joining us from Saskatoon, Chris Decker from Saskatchewan Trade Export Partnership. We have Hello, Chris. Patrick Matherin from here in Calgary, uh, Calgary Economic Development. Mustafa Sahin from just up the road uh, in Edmonton and Edmonton Global. And from Winnipeg, we have Mariette Muller, the president of the World Trade Center, Winnipeg. I'm glad you didn't focus just on energy. With Western Canada, we always get the energy stuff, but there's so much. Yeah. I think in that vein, Let's go to uh, Mariette to start, and then maybe Chris, work our way through uh, some of the good ag news and some other questions. So yeah, Mariette, yeah. We'll, we'll have the honors in Winnipeg this time. And, and please educate me, you know, don't assume that I necessarily have the answer to your question. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing your comments and your perspectives. Uh, I mean, this is part of the reason for, for this exchange, right? It's an exchange. Uh, premièrement, merci beaucoup, Ambassador uh, Clark. That was great remarks, and I can see that you are well connected with Mexico, and and we are too as a World Trade Center. So the World Trade Center is about 300 World Trade Centers around the world, and there are 13 in Mexico that we work with quite closely. Our last annual general meeting was actually in Querétaro. Uh, then in oh, quelle chance, quelle chance. <laughs> C'était magnifique. Um, so we, we have, as you know, you've mentioned it in Western Canada, it's certainly um, Mexico is, is one of our exporting and importing partner, very important. Um, so we have, a, we have a company called High Life, and it's a big uh, pork uh, company out of Manitoba, who is now in um, uh, Salvatierra in uh, Guanajuato. And they shared with us some of their, their um, experience, uh, positive and not so positive. And one of the things that is a little bit what you just spoke about, uh, the cultural part, the understanding the culture, how people function. And I think for them, they're, they're kind of um, tricks of the trade that they had to learn. 
and, and that now they, they become uh, pro proponents of wanting to spread the word is that difference is a lot more than maybe is expected when they, you get to it. So the, I guess my questions are around, okay, first of all, the difference between maybe exporting to Mexico or actually investing and in having a presence. And if you have a presence, what are kind of the little red flags? Uh, they spoke about unions, they spoke about having management yep. there that yep. understands. So can you speak a little bit about that? Because I yep. think that's the key, you can't start doing business if you don't understand people. So. Quelle, quelle excellente question, bien réfléchie, bien pensée, puis je suis complètement d'accord avec la prémisse, les prémices de votre, de votre question. Euh, euh, puis j'apprécie que, que nous ayons une francophone sur cet appel, ça me fait énormément plaisir, puis je m'excuse que dans mes remarques, j'ai parlé uniquement en, en anglais. But I'll switch back to English to capture the full uh, audience on, uh, on this issue, and you know, your point is so well made. So Mexico is part of North America, yes, but it's part of Latin America as well. Uh, and so culturally, there are things that happen um, in, uh, in Mexico that uh, cause us, you know, surprise as fellow North Americans. So one piece of advice is if you are thinking uh, of doing business with Mexico, get a local partner, get a local partner that knows the lay of the land. And when I say local, I don't mean necessarily, you know, a big Mexico City law firm. If you're working in Querétaro or Guanajuato, you might want to look to, you know, a really local interlocutor that can help you navigate the bureaucracy, the realities, read what's happening, I, you know, read the, read the, uh, the, the, the context. Um, second of all, you know, the Canadian government and indeed provincial governments are present as I indicated in my presentation. And, you know, uh, we have an extraordinary uh, team here in Mexico, whether it's EDC, whether it's the Trade Commissioner Service, whether it's uh, Alberta, whether it's Saskatchewan, whether it's Ontario, Ontario is not part of Western Canada, of course, but you know, I'll mention them. Quebec is here as well. So there's expertise on the ground that you can draw on uh, to get advice about, you know, It may be as simple as, is this a secure, you know, part of the country for me to live or to operate or to travel to, you know? Uh, what are, we, you know, what's happening on the COVID front? You know, I mean, it could, it could be, you know, very basic things like that. You have an embassy here. Uh, take advantage of the fact that, uh, that we're here and knock on our door. We're more than happy uh, to say, this makes sense that perhaps doesn't make sense, or this will make sense in three years time under different circumstances. Um, but you know, I return to getting a local partner and having an appreciation for the fact that Mexico is a great country. You know, this is a great, uh, it's a great civilization. And uh, when we approach it, uh, we should approach it with that in mind. And that means making an effort uh, to speak uh, their language having appreciation for their uh, culture, um, their food. I mean, I, I know these are very boilerplate things to put on, put on the table, but we sometimes forget them because as I say, we think we're in North America and that North America uh, speaks English. And as we all know, North America also speaks French and also speaks Spanish. Uh, and we have to, And I think that we as Canadians perhaps have a, you know, we have a natural advantage in that sense, given that we, you know, we're, we're multicultural, we have two official languages, we have a sensibility on that front that I think opens our minds and opens the doors for us to be um, uh, effective in the Mexican market. Sorry, I could go on and on and on because I love the question and I won't. I'll, I'll shut up. But those tips and tricks can help you in the United States as well. Uh, You're so right, Carlo, you're so right. And uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting over the next 20 and 30 years to see the nature of the debate that our American cousins will have on the issue of uh, Spanish language services, Spanish language education. I mean, it's going to be really interesting and they'll be coming to us to figure out how we got it right most of the time uh, on the issue of managing a number of, uh, of two official languages, right? Mr. Decker. 
Welcome. Thank you, Carlo. And um, at the outset, my apologies to you, Ambassador, to my um, colleagues on the speaker panel and to participants for being late. While this speaker series is called Trade Ahead, there's also <laughs> this thing called Spring Ahead. <laughs> And Saskatchewan, of course, does not because we're slightly ahead of everybody. And so my apologies. I had this at one o'clock CST, but glad to, to glad to join you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's an important relationship, uh, Western Canada, and particularly Saskatchewan and Mexico. We did $710 million worth of exports into that market, largely agricultural commodities. Uh, and it was a great year. It was an increase. Part of the, uh, the need to feed the world is not pause for pandemic. Um, exactly. And it's something that we need to grow. Um, we organize a lot of um, uh, trade missions into Mexico on a yearly basis when things were normal uh, and into the areas and regions and markets that you mentioned, uh, Monterrey and, and Guadalajara. One of the issues expressed by our buyers and our business partners is transportation between Canada and Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, particularly during times of difficult uh, times with our respective neighbors, ours to the south and Mexico's to the north. Uh, we're landlocked, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, and uh, so it's sea, road and rail, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what opportunities there might be in expanded uh, transportation and, and export corridors north and south between Western Canada and Mexico. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know whether you heard in my presentation, and I, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder by saying that Saskatchewan is going to uh, embed in the embassy uh, going forward. I don't know exactly which department of the government of Saskatchewan, but I really, really welcome uh, that, that dimension and that sensitivity uh, uh, at, uh, in our operations, in Canada's operations in, in, in Mexico. So. I hope I'm not. I hope I haven't let the cat out of the bag. I probably have, you know. But uh, it's it's pending, ambassador. It's pending. Oh dear. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, let's just. Well, let's let's put it in the conditional and not in the not in the indicative. Um, you know, there are different bits to your to your question. Um, I think, you know, one of the one of the one of the interesting lessons learned will be how uh, our supply chains uh, you know, managed to remain more or less resilient uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and as I was saying in my, in my prepared uh, remarks, it's fascinating how well uh, on the agricultural front we've managed, you have managed to do, we have managed to do uh, over the past, uh, over the past uh, year. And I think that speaks to the robustness of the systems that, that are you know, in place. Um, I, you know, to, to, the, to, to the actual point of your question, I don't know the answer to your question, um, and, uh, but I'd be very happy to explore that with, uh, with, my, uh, with my staff and perhaps to get back to you and can have a bilateral discussion about this. I really just don't know. Um, so I'd, rather than invent something, I'll just say that I don't know. Um, but as I say, I take com from the f comfort from the fact that, uh, that well, people to people link linkages have been impeded very significantly by the, uh, by the pandemic, uh, including by uh, Air Canada and Aero Mexico and, and, and other Canadian um, uh, operators. You know, there are no direct flights between Canada uh, and Mexico at the moment. And that's had a, that's, that's, that hasn't gone down well with, uh, with Mexicans. Uh, uh, or indeed with Canadian snowbirders who are looking to, uh, to come down to Mexico. Um, so, but on the issue of the movement of, 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 of goods and uh, uh, including agricultural goods, it's very interesting to see that uh, the impact has not been negative and that we've been able to continue to, uh, to function. But, you know, we really need also, and forgive me, I'm going, I'm going beyond your question because it's, it's a good question. Um, we really need a sort of a lessons learned discussion among the three countries about management of pandemics. And I don't mean by that just the, the, the public health policy aspects and, you know, vaccines and PPE. I mean, how do we sustain the resiliency and the dynamism and the prosperity of the North American space? Because as I was saying in my little presentation, you know, we are, 
we're, we're, we're joined at the hip, right? So we have to find a way to work uh, together, not just with the big brother in, uh, to the south of us, but uh, with our Mexican, uh, Mexican friends. So thank you. So th th that'll be an upcoming CWF policy. Oh, okay. Have I stolen your thunder? I'm terrible. I'm stealing everybody's thunder today, Carla. No, no, I, I'm thinking Chris just mm -hmm. subtly slipped that into my work plan for next right. year. Right, right. We also have a right. North American pandemic treaty that's proved yes, true. useless during this pandemic. True. Nothing well, you, I wouldn't agree with useless, but but yes, we have a treaty. You're right. You can say okay. that. I can't. <laughs> I, I can say that. So let's uh, go to Alberta. Patrick, Mustafa, who wants to jump off first? I'll jump in. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for the one for your service to Canada. I, I think all of us have come to rely very much on the, the Trade Commission service uh, and immigration services as well. That is an integral part of what we do day in and day out. Um, we're, we're fortunate in Calgary, of course, to be home to the, the Consulate of Mexico here. Um, and Chris, that's right. That's right. Chris, to help you out, of course, we're the confluence of the Trans Canada Highway and the Canamex Highway which takes you all the way down the spine of the Rockies and into Mexico. So we're always willing to help you out that way as well. Uh, and we're looking for the return of that direct flight <laughs> one in our future as well. Uh, but I, I'm really interested as many of our jurisdictions are on the flow of foreign direct investment. Um, you mentioned yeah. earlier on that, that Canada has obviously seen the opportunity uh, in the mining sector and certainly uh, Canada and Calgary in particular has a number of companies that are positioned to work in the oil and gas industry. But I'm wondering yeah. on the reciprocal side, if you were to offer advice to us as agencies, where should we be focusing our time and attention when it comes to inbound foreign direct investment from Mexico? What a, what a great question. Um, and uh, as you know, there is, a, there is a great reciprocal imbalance in aspects of the, uh, of the relationship, and that's, that's one of them. Um, uh, I believe... Uh-oh, we're gonna have to push for improved telecom capacity. <laughs> So, Carlo, you can stretch this next 40 minutes out, I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and have us lose half the audience. And the, 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 would, it, would, it, would it help if we, get, if we went off camera, Carlo, would that help at all? I don't know, it's, it's probably the link in Mexico. But... Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's the Mexico link. You Sorry, know, I'm, back. Back. I'm back, I'm back. Okay, uh, there you I go. don't know what's that. Yeah, here I am. Uh, it's not that I didn't want to answer the question, is that <laughs> Sometimes the internet is unreliable uh, uh, here. Um, so, you know, the ag sector, uh, obviously, uh, agribusiness, uh, I think those are, uh, you know, those are, those are interesting potential uh, areas. Uh, education, uh, education marketing. Um, and, you know, speaking of reciprocity, what's really interesting on the education file is that we're much more successful in terms of attracting Mexican students to Canada than the Mexicans are in terms of attracting Canadian students uh, to Mexico. And I, you know, I'd love to do anything I can to change that uh, dynamic because that's one way of building the relationship, right? Is having Canadian students go down and learn Spanish, right? For three months in Cuernavaca or, um, and, and I think there's real appetite uh, throughout Canada actually for, uh, for that. So there are a few initial uh, rumblings, but uh, Patrick, why don't, you know, why don't we have a subsequent uh, discussion or I can put you in touch with uh, the person who's following this, uh, this particular file and he can give you some very, you know, some very good strategic advice uh, uh, on the issue that you just raised. Sure. Thank you very much. To, to, to help out. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Grandma put back at me for this one. Are you going to help me? Do, uh, for, this is a change. <laughs> hey, we don't have to go back that far. Um, food <laughs> and then, then the, the food industry. Canadian yeah, that's right. That Canada bread is owned by Grupo Bimbo. That's right. Which that's is the Mexican food processing conglomerate. Um, yeah. So there are reverses in, in what we normally think of in terms of yeah. Uh, the relationship. 
And I think especially as we look towards the TPP um, and we look towards going out into markets, companies that have the capacity and facility in working in difficult markets, developing markets, companies that have a global footprint. You know, I always think that Canada bread was never going to make it outside of Canada um, on their own resources and power. But going through Grupo Bimbo, which already has relationships abroad, and it's certainly not just Latin America, but around the Pacific Rim, you know, there's an opportunity. So I think food processing would be an interesting yep. thing. Um, I, I'd agree, know you know, and, and let's not forget, Mexico's a rich country, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's both, I mean, yes, there are areas of, um, you know, poverty and there are marginalized uh, communities, and yes, there are, there, are, there are challenges, right? And we've seen this in the management of the pandemic. On the other hand, an enormous middle class, uh, you have all the grupos in, uh, in Monterrey, um, and I think uh, there's also just, you know, the, the Canada brand is a very positive brand uh, here. So uh, I'm surprised that there isn't more, you know, investment from Mexico to, to Canada, given the circumstances uh, that, uh, that we're living. And given the fact, as I say, that Canada has this, this sort of positive vibe about it, you know, so. Um, I'm happy that I went after Patrick this time because I keep stealing Patrick's thunder with my question. So this time at least we didn't, <laughs> didn't have to worry about that, Patrick. Um, Ambassador, I, I, want to, I, I want to throw something that I think will be more in your wheelhouse. And that's when I look at the, the macro level relationship between Canada and, and Mexico. And we look at yeah. the fact that there's obviously a trade imbalance, which is not yeah. a huge shock, right? It's almost $30 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you look at the investment relationship and it's a, an imbalance in the other direction. But correct. I have this correct. overall feeling that there's tremendous unrealized potential in the Canada-Mexico trade relationship that we just haven't realized. And, and at some point, I, I think collectively, we want to uncover where are those opportunities that we haven't taken full advantage of yet. But the part that I think is in your wheelhouse is the role of politics on the business landscape and political relationships and the political environment. Question is, is there any collateral damage to the NAFTA renegotiations, and there were a couple awkward moments where Canada and Mexico were yep. played against each other by yep. the U.S., right, yep. for, with strategic yep. intent. Yep. And the current political environment in Mexico, how conducive or much of a deterrent is it for Canadian businesses who would say, at a high level, I think there's opportunity there for me, but should I be going in now? Should I wait? Are there incentives? How can TCS let me find a soft spot? Any thoughts on that area? Yeah, no, uh, very pertinent, uh, very pertinent question. Uh, first of all, on the issue of imbalances, right? I mean, the one sector I believe where we are in balance is actually agriculture, where uh, you know that's that's more or less uh, that's more or less in uh, in balance. And you're right, we have a we have a deficit, but we have more investments in Mexico, and in a sense, they have they don't have a deficit in terms of investments, but they are not as present as one we we would wish them uh, 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 to be. You know, investment decisions are investment decisions. Uh, it's not for the Canadian government to say to a company, you know, you shouldn't invest here, you shouldn't invest now. Uh, we can provide all the intelligence that. Uh, that uh, we have uh, available uh, to us, but at the end of the day, you know, it's up to um, it's up to uh, individual companies to make their decisions um, as to where they wish to uh, invest or where they wish to uh, to export. That said, I think your question is great because it it really implies a sort of strategic mapping out of where uh, where the opportunities are. And again, I think this is for the Trade Commissioner Service to uh, you know. And, and EDC uh, to provide you with that uh, that sort of uh, that sort of advice, um, and you know I hear you on politics versus economics or politics versus investment decisions, um, and you know you can you can say that yes, uh, perhaps this is a challenging time, perhaps this is a tricky time for Canada and Mexico, but I will say I will say uh, that. Uh, we have 
we have allies and support, you know, within the government. Um, we have allies and support because Mexico is a federation in, you know, different state uh, capitals and the cities. And what's what I find fascinating about this job is that it's a it's a North American job in the same way that Kirsten Hillman, when she has to make the case for something in, in Washington, doesn't just go to the executive but builds a coalition, you know, in Congress or in the Senate, or goes and sees uh, uh, state governors. We have to be agile and nimble and strategic in the same way in in uh, in uh, in Mexico. And uh, and the final thing I'd say is, you know, there are governments, and then there are relationships between states and between uh, countries. Um, and as I said at the end of my, uh, of my 10 minute disquisition, uh, we are inevitably tied. So we have to find the ways um, to work together, you know? Um, and let me just put one irritant on the table from the Mexican perspective, right? We decided to, 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 um, to shut down all flights between uh, uh, Mexico and, uh, and Canada. Um, that and I understand, you know, and we understand the reasons why we, the Canadian government took that decision. You know, we want to, we want to protect our people, protect our societies. Um, and, uh, but from the Mexican perspective, it means that they don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of Canadian tourists, tourists coming to uh, Cancun or Puerto Vallarta or, um, and, uh, and spending and, uh, uh, and sleeping in, in hotels. And uh, they are, they are concerned about that, and they're looking forward to the moment when the Canadian government uh, will lift that uh, interdiction, which should be, I think, uh, I believe, at the end of uh, at the end of uh, of April. So um, there we go. I I would be remiss too if I didn't point out that, um, in fact, Alberta has a trade surplus with Mexico, in spite of the larger Canadian trade numbers. So we're not <laughs> ones who fall in that uh, spectrum. Um, and, that's and very that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why I've got a picture of a canola field behind me. It's because that's our third largest <laughs> export to Mexico. <laughs> I was wondering what that was, but uh, yeah. it's so like it's a about, yellow distant blur. Yeah, it's about, uh, in Alberta's case, it's about a billion dollars a year of exports to Mexico. So it's, it's quite significant. That's very significant. That's very yeah. significant. And, and you know, agri-food is a, is a big opportunity. I think that is one of the low-hanging fruits, which is yeah, instead I of agree. just the raw commodities, are there opportunities for and we've talked about this in the past, yeah. Mariette has mentioned it, plant protein fractionation is one of these food security opportunities to, to be explored. The rail act, you know, access from Canada right through into Mexico, as well as going the other direction in terms of getting to Asia and, and bypassing the US port. So I think there's some opportunities on uh, as we grow. A lot of, fried food, a lot of fried food in Mexico. That's, <laughs> canola, and canola oil actually is an important health benefit for the other choices Mexico would have. So we contribute we contribute in many ways to the Mexican, uh, to the health of the Mexican economy and the health of the Mexican the people. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, Carlo. Uh, I have a question and maybe yeah. I, I'm off here, but um, I heard that just recently Mexico has banned the uh, glycified steaks mm -hmm. and genetically modified corn in the country. Um, is that what's going on right now? Has it officially been banned? And if so, what are the issues for Western Canada? Like we do export, uh, like Mustafa just said, uh, a lot of canola, also from Manitoba, yeah. and yeah. wheat and, and canary seed to Mexico. So, um, what are what what is going on with that? Uh, inter I'd, I'd love to. Can I pass, uh, Carlo? Can I? I'm sure that I've got Fred Caldwell uh, in the audience somewhere, and I'd really like an expert to respond on that very specific question. Is that possible, or? Uh, or is it just uh, among us, entre nous? Uh, well, if if we can bring him in, he'll show up in about ten seconds. If not, you're on your own. Uh, oh my goodness! Okay. The what a if friend. In the office, you can holler down the hall and get him to walk down. <laughs> no, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, I'm in this. Uh, I'm in my apartment here in Mexico City. So, and I'm sure he's the one that that prepared me for this. Uh, for this event, but I really, I would really that he answer this uh, question. Why don't we go to another question? See if he emerges, and then, uh, and then we'll see. Actually, it looks like looks good. Like oh, thank God, here I am, Fred. Answer the question, please. 
<laughs> good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and, and, and it's a pleasure to answer the question. On the glyphosate issue, uh, it's something that we're, we're, we're definitely monitoring. Uh, and Agriculture Canada actually has staff here in the, in the embassy as well. Uh, it, 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 it is an area of concern right now. Canada, our exports, our export, sorry, uh, won't actually be, be impacted because we're not, we're not shipping glyphosate uh, directly from Canada to Mexico. Where there's, you know, potential concern going, going forward is on the issue on um, maximum residue levels. Uh, so that is not on the, uh, on the agenda right now. And if when we're turning to corn, um, the, the impact is on white corn. Uh, and so Canada doesn't export white corn, but obviously um, we want to make sure that Mexico is taking science-based decisions uh, when, when they're going forward. So there are they're, they're issues we're engaging on uh, because we want to make sure that our market access isn't, uh, isn't impacted. And I think it's, it, it's something that's created a political discussion within, uh, within the Mexican government. If we actually look at the Mexican Secretary of, uh, of Agriculture, uh, he studied, I, I believe, biotechnology, his PhD in biotechnology at the University of Calgary. So, uh, so, 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 so we have an interlocutor who, who does see, who has witnessed the benefits and seen the benefits of, of, uh, of technology, uh, the, the technology and agri-food nexus. Okay, merci, Frédéric. I wasn't sure if I had read that. Merci beaucoup. Okay, merci. You know, it's always one of the signs of a, of a, of a good manager is to have much smarter people uh, supporting him or her. And there is a very good instance of, uh, of that. Thank you, Fred. Oh, Patrick, and stay here. I, I, I just wanted to, to shift tact a bit. Um, you know, as Western Canada also changes its composition of the economy, moving into service oriented, moving into technology in particular in the major centers, um, we've talked a lot about the agriculture and the energy side. There's some major urban centers in Mexico, and there's got to be a burgeoning technology sector that, um, frankly, I'm not familiar with. I think, think all of us end up going to Mexico to go to the coastal resorts. So I'm just wondering if you had any insight into the, the, the technology opportunities taking place in Mexico. I'm going to I'm going to defer to Fred, but I'll say a few uh, I'll say a few platitudes uh, to get things started. And you know, one of the fascinating things about this country is that uh, there are great regional differences north-south. So Monterey, the Northeast, the border area with the US is a very different economic and social uh, reality from what you see when you go south towards the, uh, towards the Guatemalan uh, border. And yes, there are cities that feel very North American, you know, that feel like a Calgary or an Edmonton or a Saskatchewan, a Saskatoon or a, or, or Winnipeg, um, but there are other parts of the country that feel uh, very different. So there, that's a fascinating sort of divergence uh, uh, that you uh, that you see uh, in the country. Um, Fred, do you have anything to add? Yes. The so the the ICT market is uh, is quite buoyant. Uh, here we see clusters developing uh, within within the country. Guadalajara has really tried to position itself. As, as the new Silicon Valley of, uh, of Mexico. In Monterey as well, you see a, a really important software cluster. Uh, and, then, and, and then along the border states, uh, border cities as well, like Tijuana, Mexicali as well, there, there's some regional hubs there. Uh, areas where we're seeing a lot of opportunity uh, is everything related to Industry 4.0 and helping to you know, bring the manufacturing sector in Mexico into this, into this new era. Uh, significant opportunities in cybersecurity, uh, uh, especially as we're looking at more you, uh, automobiles are, are connected devices now. So it's not right. just cybersecurity for banks, has, which, which has been a, a good area of opportunity, but also for the auto parts manufacturers, um, also to help them protect their, their intellectual property. And I think finally, I'd mentioned that we, we do have a really nice success story uh, recently of an Alberta-based company called Run With It Synthetics, uh, who uh, they started prospecting the Mexico market a couple of years ago. Uh, they're in the AI sphere. Um, Mirna, I, I had the pleasure of working with her on, on, on one of our women in international trade visits. And now they've actually, uh, they, they've been able to participate in, in a 
a variety of initiatives here. And they've actually hired their first employee uh, in Mexico for, for business development. So uh, the Western Canadian uh, IT, IT market is, is seeing opportunities here and, and is taking advantage of them. And, and Ambassador, just on that front, you know, tying in the education piece, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of Canadians aren't familiar with the fact that there's an MIT in, in Mexico as well, right? The, the Monterey Institute of Technology Technical. is a very Technical. highly regarded technical You're institute. Right. And there are right. probably some opportunities to try and explore synergies with University of Alberta, University of Calgary, what's going on with AI and ML here and, you know, using each other as gateway markets, right? Using getting Canadian tech to use Mexico as a gateway into Latin America. Uh, so I think there's probably something complementary to what you were just talking about, Fred, that could be explored on the education front into the tech space as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's a natural partnership and linkage there. Sorry, Carlo. Yeah. Combining those resources, you also have access to the TPP markets. So companies working together, you can take advantage of the TPP to move personnel seamlessly around Asia, something you can't do with an American counterpart because they're not part of the agreement. Exactly. Again, it gives exactly. you a back door, not only to North America, you can take those partnerships and use them in the U.S., and you can use them around the Pacific, something you can't do if you're partnering with an American company. You can only work in the American market, the Mexican market, but if you partner with the Mexicans, you can take advantage of the, of the broader trade agreement. So something else with firms to think about. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Good. Ambassador, a quick question. Um, yes, Chris. We've all had to pivot and reallocate our resources to virtual yep. opportunities because of COVID-19 restrictions, whether that's virtual trade missions or virtual B2Bs, and they're valuable, but our members in particular are saying, we need to get back engaged. We need to get back in person. And I'm wondering if you could give us um, a quick overview of the COVID-19 situation in Mexico. And we know that there's very specific and deep challenges there, but do you have a, a, an update you can give us on caseload, on management? whether or not there's going to be a reopening of the border, which we know is inter inextricably intertwined with yeah. the U.S., whether or not there'll be requirements for vaccine visas or passports, which we know might be difficult given its reliance on tourism. But can you give us a quick COVID-19 update on Mexico? I'd be delighted. Um, it's been a challenge. Um, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a very challenging experience, I'd say, for... Um, for this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I spoke of earlier on in, a, in an earlier response to one of the questions, I spoke about sort of regional differences, but there are also socioeconomic uh, divergences and, 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 and differences here. And uh, there are some communities in this country that have suffered uh, more than others. And of course, the same goes for Canada, right? I mean, if you look at uh, the COVID numbers in uh, um, in among the elderly, in, uh, in homes, indigenous peoples, uh, marginalized urban groups, uh, you know, there are some lessons learned that we as Canadians, I think, have to engage in, in terms of the management of, uh, of, uh, of this crisis. Um, I don't have any information on issues such as border or vaccine uh, passports. I, I just don't know. I know that those things are going to be, you know, are subject of discussion. Um, I know also that we may soon have a North American leader summit at some point and pandemic drawing lessons from the management of the pandemic uh, in the North American economic space will almost certainly be something uh, on the uh, on the table. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to steal my own prime minister's thunder uh, on those um, on those uh, issues in terms of you know, the first part of your question is, and, and I so agree with it, you know, I'm, I too am sick of these Zoom calls and uh, not, not of this one in particular, because I'm always delighted to accept Carla's <laughs> invitations, but, you know, I'd rather be there in person. Um, and, uh, and the same goes for Mexicans who, as you know, value the sort of mano a mano, the building of the personal relationship the, 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 the in-person engagement, which is, I think, you know, critical to business success in the, uh, in the Mexican market, and I might say in virtually any market, right? So yes, we are looking forward to a day soon when we will be able to, uh, 
when we will be able to, uh, to meet in person. I'll give you a very personal example from my own, from up, an, an, another part of my responsibilities. Uh, I uh, have been charged with, you know, finding a new chancery for Canada and Mexico City because the chancery we have, the, the main office building is, um, has, we've just outgrown it. It's no longer, uh, it's no longer really safe. And uh, I have a team in Ottawa that uh, engages with me via Zoom, but they need to come here to actually physically scope out a site and say, this is where we should build. This is how we should be organized. These are the risks and these are the opportunities of this particular neighborhood. And so I hear you in terms of the desire to be there on the spot, physically, uh, physically present. As to when, um, the Mexican government is, uh, has quite an ambitious roadmap in terms of uh, uh, vaccination. So, you know, but it's not impossible that in the fall we might be able to, you know, have trade missions, uh, have uh, political contact. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's possible. Maybe optimistic, but I think that's, that's possible. So I don't have all the answers to your questions. I, I sort of, I feel your pain. I share your pain. Um, and, uh, you know, on a very personal note, I had to go back recently to, uh, to tend to, a to, uh, to a very ill parent and, uh, no, it's not easy traveling from, uh, Mexico to Canada at the moment. You know, you've got to go through the U S the U S has their requirements, got to sign a, a, a form saying, I promise that I don't have uh, COVID. I don't know whether that's terribly useful, but anyway, we have to do that. Uh, there's of course the three day uh, quarantine. Um, so, you know, my sister who's coming from another uh, country also to visit this elderly parent, uh, you know, three days in a hotel room, she paid 1500 bucks for the privilege of staying there. Her COVID test came back neg negative within 12 days, uh, 12 hours rather. And, but she had still prepaid for this hotel, but you know, so it's, it's tricky. Uh, at the moment, and I look forward to, and forgive me for putting these personal anecdotes on the table, but but sometimes they're they're a way of you know approaching an issue in a way that's understandable. Um, you know, I look forward to to the end of that. Uh, I, I I look forward to a return to uh, to some form of normality, right? And here's a prediction: I think that in I think that there's going to be all this pent up demand to invest to travel, to be a tourist, to invest. And, uh, you know, a year from now, and we look back on this sort of dark moment in our national life and in our hemispheric life, we'll say to ourselves, wow, um, uh, you know, there's been almost sort of a boomerang effect from the fact that uh, uh, the pandemic is now over and let's have fun and let's do stuff and let's make money and, um, and you know that will be a wonderful moment. We're not quite there yet, but uh, but I think we will see that. So I Carlo, hope you're the, right. <laughs> Car so Carlo, the headline is that Ambassador Clark is predicting a, a new baby boom generation coming out of the <laughs> pandemic, like we had well, after the Second World War. You know, you know what it is. I think of it more as the Roaring Twenties, right? Um, <laughs> I mean. Uh, think back now the roaring 20s didn't end very well in 1929 so perhaps that's not a good perhaps that's not a good precedent but uh, you know i was i was reading just yesterday about the 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 rate of savings that individual canadians right i mean people aren't spending um and uh so dollars are gathering in certain certain banks at bank accounts and i think that canadians like mexicans like americans like europeans are going to want to spend some of that when this is over. So uh, I don't think that's a pretty, I don't think that's a far out prediction. I think that's conventional wisdom, isn't it? I'm booked for a year from today, by the way. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I didn't get that. Done, I said, I, I'm booked to go to Mexico for a holiday in March of 2022. So I'm ready. I think, I think that's safe. And if you get into trouble, we'll fish you out of the water. <laughs> Thank you. Uh oh, okay, so we've got that on tape. You know, <laughs> I don't think we've ever had this much success getting people to visit Western Canada in the winter. Um, you know, the, the virtual thing hasn't been 
terrible. It's opened up a new way for us to do business. And I think that will persist. So what has been a weakness sometimes in the past, I think we'll be able to benefit from that. But you know, Ambassador, we have got to learn the lessons and apply the lessons from this pandemic um, going forward. We didn't respond the first time the World Trade Center was bombed. It was only the second time when the towers actually went down that we took the lessons of what had been an ongoing threat. Um, and we realized that it was ongoing and prepared. So hopefully we're also doing the hard work to think about institutionalizing the learning um, from response right, right. to pandemics and having those systems yep. in place. Yep. I hate to be the downer, yep. but uh, that's something that really has me personally worried that we're, we're not institutionalizing, taking the notes, applying the lessons, thinking about making the investments in infrastructure the same way we did after September the 11th, if, uh, changes to transportation infrastructure, investments in systems at airports and elsewhere. But that's also a business opportunity. We've got a lot of that happening out here in the West too, uh, improvements in the airports. That's a, that's a really interesting parallel, uh, Carlo, and, and you're right, you know, it behooves us as governments, as societies, as business people, uh, to, to draw those lessons learned, to institutionalize the, those lessons. Uh, and even if it's simply on the you know, public health front, right? And none of us is an expert in public health, but uh, let's hope that those discussions are, are, are going on. But there's, you know, there's the issue of the supply chains of PPE, of our domestic capacity to produce vaccines, uh, our, our policy mix in terms of the sort of counter cyclical spending that the government is engaged in. Um, you know, we we have to as a society have that uh, have those discussions right um so uh i look forward to further discussions carlo chaired by you with your colleagues and friends across western canada uh, i can just see the title of your next uh, of your next uh, session drawing the lessons from the pandemic that's something that I, I think there is, that's one of the few areas, I think, politically that's open for cooperation in North America. Yeah, I agree. I agree. About the current administration in Mexico, I can say that. Um, no, but, I mean, I agree with you. You're right. I mean, there are other areas such as, uh, you know, a climate change environment. Uh, you know, there are things that we can, uh, indigenous issues. There's our engagement uh, in Central America, you know, because obviously top of mind at the moment is, uh, Honduran and Guatemalan and Salvadoran uh, refugees banging their head against the uh, the border with the U.S. How that's managed, you know, uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to have a real North American agenda because we have that, uh, uh, frankly, at the moment, uh, and that's that's great. But there's some things we don't want the Americans hanging on us. Uh, we show up at the discussions on Central America, and suddenly the Americans are like, hey, here you go, Canada. Join and help out. So those discussions, you know, but we're, we're going off now. So right. I'm, I'm going to get you in trouble if I keep on. First, okay, I think I already am in trouble. So uh, anyway. Uh, but, but you knew that coming in. Chris, <laughs> you want to take us out with the last question? Mariette got the first one. Uh, will the guys from Edmonton and Calgary, Alberta, always kind of hogs the space when we talk about Mexico, so. Well, Goodness gracious, I think that all three of the previous trade ahead panel uh, discussions had something to do with football. So oh it's a CFL team in Mexico. <laughs> that really isn't my domain. I don't think it spreads either. <laughs> but I do commit to this. When this pandemic is over, I will come to Western Canada and I will, you know, engage and we can eat red meat and, you know, uh, and have uh, have a have a have a real conversation, not through this uh, horrible Zoom mechanism. All right, it'll be red meat and plant protein. We'll, okay, all right, and plant protein. I agree. We're, we're serving both with, and and both will be fried in canola. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Anyway, so I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you to Fred for uh, for uh, uh, supporting me when uh, when my knowledge of a certain issue was patchy. And thank you for your great questions, actually. They were, you know, it shows that you really take the market seriously, that you've done your thinking, and that you're looking ahead strategically. And I repeat my offer, any way that we can help you in that process of, you know, thinking through where we go next, where you go next, uh, we're there, we're here. Thank you very much.
Ambassador Clark. Uh, I'll join the others in giving a, giving a round of claps for you. And uh, I'll close this out by something I, I forgot at the beginning. Don bienvenida calorosa, nuestros socios y amigos en el Consejo Mexicano de Asuntos Exteriores, COMEXI, our colleagues and partners at the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations. I forgot to give a shout out to them at the start. By closing out, um, I'd like to again end where I started, thanking Export Development Canada, and a particular shout out to Mark Livingston, the Vice President for Western Canada, and his team, Carolyn Carson and others, for their support uh, for this initiative and also for exports from Western Canada. I also like to thank our partners again. You know, this is not a Canada West uh, event or production. I really look on this as a partnership and I hope that we can do something similar in the future. So Mariette Moulet from World Trade Center of Winnipeg, Chris Decker from Saskatchewan Trade Export Partnership, Mustafa Sahin from up the road in Edmonton Global and Patrick Matherin from right here in Calgary. Thank you guys a lot for participating with us. For those listening, each of the events, the rest of Asia, uh, the UK beyond Brexit, will this little piggy get to market, Western Canada's trade infrastructure rose, and the other NAFTA partner are all available online and we'll leave them up. If you have questions about particular export needs, please contact your provincial reps. They're there to help and they can handle questions directly, Export Development Canada as well. Until the next one of these, Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks again to Ambassador Clark, Fred, thank you for jumping in. And to all our colleagues out there in Western Canada and the prairies, stay safe until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir.